So good morning everyone. Um, the title of my lecture today is From the Standardization of Culture Industry to the Massification of Spectacle. Um, the lecture tackles three main points. First, I will try to explore the relation between culture commodity and capitalism explaining the distinction between indigenous culture and mass culture, stating some of the effects after the shift from the organic folk cultural production to the standardization of culture. Second, I will deal with false needs of consumer capitalism, that is how culture industry indoctrinates the society of consumers with false needs exploring here which market package pseudo needs are imprinted on human bodily structure. Third, I will deal with the concept of spectacle, that is, with how the social relations are manipulated by the image culture. Capitalism now exchanges spectacles and images more than it, it, it exchanges hard material commodities. So we will discover together how spectacle has altered our modern cultural worldviews. Of course, we should always be careful with such macro theories owing to the generalization tendencies to rule out cultural specificities. First, we have to put a distinction between culture that springs from the micro social interactions expressing human suffering and passion, hard experiences and heterogeneity. It's the organic pre-mechanized culture, okay, and the general designation of culture as part of the realm of organization, marked by the process of identifying, categorizing and classifying. It is an that is an industrialized culture of sameness and standardization. Two different types of cultures. One which is popular, organic, emanates from people's solid social interactions, and one that is industrialized or technologized, produced by corporate power. The main landmark of manufactured culture is unanimity. Buildings, decorations, monumental structure, administrations, entrepreneurial system, residential and commercial blocks, desolate cities, older buildings, slums, bungalows and trade fairs, all look liquid, ever-changing structures and share designs and features in common, irrespective of slight differences according to social context, even either in authoritarian or democratic societies. They look the same, all these structures. Deep down, the structures are more or less the same, standardized. Culture in the capitalistic system is turned into a commodity. The spread of money and capital has turned culture into an exchange for profit. <coughs> so money now cannot only purchase tangible products, but also money can buy abstract human qualities. Money now can buy beauty, intelligence, emotion, which means that abstractions may camouflage the commodification process that organizes the underlying social relations. That's one of the mysteries of commodity, according to Marx. Abstract values in a commodity world may mask social relations which are based on money, given priority of exchange value over use value. Moreover, the exchange value of culture is obscured by le the legitimations of commodity fetishism that objectifies the market and imputes an independent objective reality to commodities. What does this mean? It means that people think that the value of a thing they buy arises from its natural properties. They think this, this, this is appended to it, or it emanates from it. It's part of that particular object they buy. 
Fetishism supports a monetary system of production and mystifies how products acquire their value to the extent that people take, take them to be natural. They take it to be natural to buy a car at this sum of money and to buy a shirt at this sum of money. Even our social identities are estimated through exchange value. In mass production, money is the main fetish. It has led to the devaluation of human social life, according to Marx. Leading to a more materialistic mindset, giving more importance to material means rather than social ones. Look at the history of the distribution of knowledge and its concomitant skills. How the intelligentsia nowadays distribute their knowledge and skills within a material mind frame. Doctors, teachers, engineers. Another example is the new boom of home or private tuition, which was a rare thing in the past. It is now a booming industry with schools and agencies looking for clients and processing payments. In commodity cultures, education is commodified and universities invest in the economy of knowledge abroad. Thanks to social media, the world has some access to a fair distribution of free knowledge, although commoditization still meddles with the process via posting advertisements on free websites. So Lukács, in his book, uh, History and Class Consciousness, <coughs> maintains that fetishism of commodities is part of a general reification process. He uses the term reification. Reification process in that people regards it now as natural to cast, for instance, their conjugal relations in terms of money, or process of education of their children and their health care in a monetary exchange. Now, people, what does verification mean? It means that you take things to be natural, you take them for granted. This commodity world is verified to the extent that people now, even their social relations, they, that is, they evaluate them in terms of money. Conjugal relations are exchanged in terms of money. Education also is evaluated in terms of money. Healthcare is also, that is, uh, um, uh, that is, is included in monetary exchange. There are some special doctor, specialist doctors in Morocco who may ask to be paid in advance for their visiting fee. Huh? They ask you to pay in advance for their visiting fee. What is the humanitarian care? in all this. What does reification mean? It means people believe that social structures are natural, given and taken for granted, beyond people's control, and are, and are unchangeable. So a political system, if it is reified, it means that people take it to be natural, they don't know its historical origin, and of course, they look at it as unchangeable, beyond their control to change. In a capitalistic system, people confront a reality of social classes, exploitation, an equal division of labor, mercantile interests, but instead of grasping the phenomenon as humanly created, they see it as natural. That is reification. Reification is also when Moroccans attribute the distribution of provision and wealth to God while it is structured by human hands. God doesn't create the poor and the rich as such as we see it. God is represented as just in his holy book. Poverty in Morocco, for instance, results from inadequate policies and wrong economic choices that lay people find it very hard to grasp. Now we move to discuss the Frankfurt School's concept of culture industry. 
The term culture industry was perhaps used for the first time in the book of Dialectic Enlightenment, which Hockheimer and Adorno published in Amsterdam in 1947. They used the term culture industry to distinguish it from um, popular culture or organic popular culture that springs from the spontaneous social interactions of the masses, as we said yesterday. Culture industry fuses the old and familiar into new technologized form tailored for consumption and which to a great extent determines the nature of that consumption. It's manufactured according to schematic structures by economic and administrative organization. The culture industry addresses its consumers from a top-down perspective and both high and low culture are linked to the expediency of the medium they are at the disposal of the technology of communication. The idea that the customer is king, as the culture industry, according to Hockheimer and Dorno, would have us believe is not true. It's a mere figment of imagination. We are not, sub we are not the subject of cultural production in culture industry. We are its object. Cultural production is less concerned with the masses or the techniques of communication than with inflating the voices of capital, amplifying the voice of ownership and media sponsors. The mass media target audience not to mobilize them or to make them aware of political or economic social issues, but to turn them into consumers, to grow economic capital. The cultural commodities of industry are estimated by their profit value, not by their own specific content and structure. The entire practice of the culture industry transfers the profit motive bear onto cultural forms. The moment these cultural forms start collecting profit for their producers as commodities in the marketplace, they have already possessed something of this quality of value. The postulate that works of art are autonomous is eliminated by culture industry with or without conscious will of those in control of the media. The culture industry doesn't need to show that it, uh, to show it is oriented towards profit. It doesn't, do, it doesn't have to show it. Economic interest is objectified in its ideology. It's even independent of the compulsion to sell the cultural commodities, which must be consumed anyway. Culture industry turns into public relations, for instance, manufacturing goodwill, irrespective of cultural commoditization. In this respect, there is general and critical consensus that advertising is produced for the world so that each product of the culture industry becomes its own advertisement. Let's explain the word industry here, used in the expression culture industry. The word industry should not be taken too literally. It should refer to the standardization of the product. Take the example of Hollywood film industry, familiar to every goer, and also the word refers to the rationalization of distribution techniques. The concept of technique in the cold shop industry is only identically named with technique in the works of art. In art, technique is concerned with the internal organization of the object itself, with its inner structure. In contrast, the technique in culture industry is from the beginning one of distribution and mechanical reproduction and therefore always remains external to the object, it's not internal. The culture industry finds ideological support by distancing itself from the full potential of the techniques contained in its products. It derives its existence from its parasitical form as extra artistic technique of the material production of goods. Therefore, it is liberated from the demands of aesthetic autonomy 
It's hardly concerned. Cultural industry is hardly concerned with aesthetic quality of the artwork presented to the audience. It's concerned with commoditization. Adopting Benjamin's critical view, if you're still a member of traditional work of art, based on the concept of aura, culture industry manifests the presence of that which is not present in the sense that there is no opposite principle to the, of aura in culture industry. We don't have that principle opposite to aura in culture industry. According to Hochheimer and Adorno, the concept of aura is preserved in cultural industry, but in an ambiguous, decaying form. A limbo, an ambiguity that betrays its own, its own ideological abuses, which means that um, cultural industry can commoditize low and high quality art or cultural production products. Sorry. Recently, critical voices have emerged defending culture industry on the academic scene, warning against the underestimation of the influence of culture industry, pointing to its great importance for the development of consciousness huh, of its customers. They say, in reality, whoever ignores its influence out of skepticism for what it stuffs into people would be naive. That, that is because of its social role. This, that is, our uh, um, <coughs> culture industry asks disturbing questions about, that is, um, its quality, about the truth or untruth it disseminates, and also about the aesthetic level of its own productions. There is a double-edged irony in such intellectuals' perspective. I mean those who are faithful to the culture industry's positive effects. <clears throat> and also those consumers who hesitate between the prescribed fun, uh, the yield to, and the doubt they raise on media virtues. It seems that those audience often would like to be deceived. They seek gratification from living temporary illusions, like a romantic film where the audience can experience romance and love by proxy, delegating their powers you know, to the film actors to delve in the adventure and love on their behalf. They cling to the most fleeting gratification. They cocoon themselves in a world of simulation to evoke Baudrillard's term and voice approval. Now here we, we ask the question, do these people fear that their life would be empty without sense of comfort if they, if they lose media satisfaction? Can you live nowadays without this technology of mobile or television? Even if you are convinced that it deceives you, you still cling to it. You prefer deception to a completely intolerable, between quotes, empty mode of life devoid of such gadgets. Culture industry is defended because of its ideology, its ordering factor. In a supposedly chaotic world, it provides consumers with something like standards of, for orientation, a sense of living, and that alone seems worthy of a problem. Organic culture that expresses suffering and difference is substituted by the standardized culture of good life, the appeal to order alone without concrete specificity, which is here useless, the appeal to the dissemination of norms without concretizing them in reality or internalizing them in consciousness is also futile. The culture industry has no longer anything in common with freedom. Why? Because it proclaims you should abide by the standard norms of its authority. In this way, culture industry's ideology manipulates consciousness. As I say, you always put your ideas in the form of questions if you don't understand something. Now we move to discuss <coughs> the false needs of culture industry.
Many scholars consider Herbert Marcuse's Eros and Civilization, his book, as the most important reference in the study of the capitalistic culture industry and its false needs. In addition to Theodore, uh, to the Theodore Adorno's and Max Horkheimer's dialect, Dialectic of Enlightenment. What do we mean by false needs? To acquire an understanding of how culture industry creates false needs, it's important first to define capitalism because it's the source of these needs together with culture industry that we have already defined. According to Hale Bronner, capitalism is a unique historical formation and I, these are his words. Capitalism is a unique historical formation with core institutions and distinct movements. It involves the rise of a business class or a mercantile, he calls a, mercan, a mercantile class, the separation of production from the state, that's liberal, uh, liberal market, free capitalism, and a mentality of rational calculation, that is rationalization, that's the presence of the homo economicus. Its characteristic logic revolves around the accumulation of capital and reflects the, omnipre the omnipresence of competition. Now here he states the precept, that is the principles of capitalism. The principles capitalism is based on. So free market, accumulation of capital, and omnipresence of competition. It displays broad tendencies to unprecedented wealth creation, skewed size distributions of enterprise, large public sectors, and cycles of activity. It's, the, it's in fact these features of capitalism that have led to the creation of culture industry and false needs. <coughs> <coughs> Inevitable mass production always culminates in a monopoly over standardized, inactive consumers. This is what Adorno and Horkheimer consider as the total power of capitalism. On this point, Marcus argues that the shift from competitive, laissez-faire capitalism in the beginning of the 20th century into monopoly capitalism with big monopolies <coughs> has destabilized the power and values of the individual. Periodizing capitalism in two stages. The first stage is the free competitive capitalism or laissez-faire capitalism. And the second stage is monopoly capitalism. So the second stage of monopoly cap capitalism with big monopolies has destabilized the power and values of the individual and has pursued the standardization of culture. And I think here, uh, if you still remember Fordism, we spoke about it yesterday, that is the best example. As an example of such monopoly is taken under consideration by Adorno and Horkheimer, they talk about standard processes of production of novel, films, and music, which are manufactured as commodities through a capitalistic system regardless of artistic quality. Take another example of car industry. The design of cars may be different, but the mechanical components are fundamentally the same, as we said yesterday. The difference of brands is, after all, illusory. The advantages and disadvantages discussed by enthusiasts only serve you know, to maintain the presence of competition and choice. As you may notice, when some customers talk about the difference in cars, they speak about details. Huh? Cylinders, engine capacity, comfort, etc., color. Huh? In films, people talk about the use of technology, decor, costume, number of stars, etc. So the difference is, is in the standard value of production and has nothing to do with the meaning, huh? the deep meaning of the product itself. It means through its cost. That is, the, the cultural product or the cultural commodity means through its cost or its exchange, exchange value. According to Erbiago, okay, who has been working also on these false needs, diverse scholars have explored the rise of theme parks, fast food restaurants, chain stores, 
shopping malls, cruise trips, casinos, and other entertainment sites, showing how these sites enable customers to consume many different commodities and even to excess. All these sites of entertainment maximize consumption. These shopping malls and these, you know, uh, there is uh, chain stores and restaurants and hotels and parks and, and casinos. What's the purpose of their erection, of their establishment? To maximize consumption. Relying on Weber's thesis of rationalization and disenchantment, Ritzer claims that what unites all these mercantile apparatuses is their rational design first, intended to augment consumption, to maximize consumption, and enchant customers. Enchant them is more than attract them. It means there is to lure them to live in fantasy, in a fantasy world. This reminds us again of Baudrillard's Disneyland. Simulacra. When Benjamin talked about the age of mechanical reproduction and its effect on the human perceptual system, he didn't explore the relationship between the changes in perception and the false needs imposed by the capitalistic system. So when society imposes its needs, this leads to cultural changes that affect our desires and wants. That's the question we asked your friend yesterday about pizza, when she says, I, want, there is, I, I, I buy pizza. That means uh, here, so it means that capitalism influences, that is, uh, the culture and the cultural changes themselves affect our desires and wants. So we start desire and wanting what capitalism, so we desire and want what capitalism, that is, pushes us to, that is, um, to want and desire. When society imposes its needs, this leads to cultural changes that affect our desires and wants, and their potential gratification may alter our perception or usefulness and may even repress our animal instincts, as Marcus claims. How does modern society create needs or imprint them in individuals? This is where Weber's influence as a thinker comes into being with his instrumental reasoning theory. In Weber's theory, the way false needs are implanted in people's minds by society is through the logic of rationalization. <clears throat> what does it mean through the logic of rationalization? I give an example here. You can see the resemblance for this theory in Hollywood and its effect on people's minds and culture as a whole. It's a sort of cultural Fordism. Like the chain of McDonald's all over the world and its rational design adopting standard organization, standard components, standard service, standard labor, standard food, standard style, standard administration. <coughs> Everything about McDonald's is standardized. Though Fordism flourished in the automotive industry, it has been regarded as a pioneer economic model of the 20th century based on the manufacture of standardized mass products which standardi with standardized components using standardized processes for standardized audience. So this is how that is um, culture industry, one of the, that is one of the techniques that culture industry use or utilizes you know, to incur false needs in its customers. According to Adorno and Hockheimer, standardization has resulted in the demise of authentic individuality, the death of authentic individuality, because social needs are now homogenized, and it will be a freak of nature 
if you socially demand something slightly different from what society requires. Furthermore, this, the, the, this cultural sameness has led to a change in primal human needs. Now, people do not consider money as a false need. Do we consider it as a false need? Many of, many of us do not even use it as a means of survival. They look for it as an end in itself. So advertising is another mechanism. A further concept to be taken into consideration when analyzing the imprinting of false needs on that is in consumers' minds. When advertising uses seduction and plays on emotion and desire, to charm or attract the audience. Take the example of using film or football stars, uh, beautiful, women's, beautiful women in advertisements. Okay? This is how they reach the consumer's mind. This is how they influence his, his desires. The ads with, the, with their spectacle of emotive music and seductive image create false needs coming from that display that captured the mind and make one desire the advertised product due to what can be considered an aura of magic and divinity. I quote, an aura of magic and divinity. And this is stated in Durham and Kellner. Okay, this is stated in Durham and Kellner. So here advertisement creates an aura uh, using uh, Benjamin's aura, but this is not Benjamin's aura. This is uh, uh, the aura of culture industry, that is, an aura of magic and divinity that surrounds these items in the spots and which creates false needs, of course, you know, in the consumers. Advertising, therefore, has only created a culture industry. Advertising, therefore, that is, uh, has not only created a culture industry, but it has traversed everyone's mind through its exposure on our home screens. The victory of advertising in capitalistic societies springs from its success to compel people to imitate advertisement models. It has implanted its habits in our social conduct. Even if some consumers may recognize the fakeness of advertised products, they still buy them out of the compulsive force of television and other mediums of advertising. Even if you don't like Coke, you still buy it out of this compulsive force, you know, of television and advertising. According to Lukács, again, satisfaction of social needs for commodity creates a kind of learning and skill regarding how to satisfy those needs. This is what Adorno refers to as redefinition of needs. This redefinition of needs turns the consumer into an automaton because the needs that are created by capitalism, they are not static, they are dynamic. And so there is, uh, there is in, in, in cultural commodity, uh, there is this learning and skill regarding the redefinition of needs. They keep changing with the, with the market's needs, of course. So, the consumer is turned into an automaton, a robot, or unconscious impulsive bodily apparatus complying with the requirements of success presented by culture industry. And here I'm quoting Adorno and Hockheimer. False needs are, therefore, created in society through advertising and consumer capitalism, which basically satisfies them a process that may decrease or even repress the importance of individuals' basic needs. Take the example uh, of sex gadgets and how they give false spasms, you know, to sexual clients who place in the real sexual intercourse or the real sexual partner. If we say these are false needs, we need to distinguish between false and true human needs. False refers to those needs superimposed on the individual by particular economic interests. That's what we mean by false. 
is those needs superimposed on the individual by particular economic interests and they often repress natural impulsive needs. What do they serve these false needs? They serve the silent reproduction of patients with hard work and tolerance of economic, political and social injustices. So they maintain, they sustain the asymmetrical reports in society, social inequalities. These false needs, that is, uh, assist you in bearing, in coping up with hard toil, with poverty, with that is uh, with shortage of 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 the economic, or uh, that is of economic support. The consumer always looks for the gratification of this needs, but it is a fake ecstasy because it masks the real conditions of suffering and happiness that may push people to seek such counterfeit uh, false indulgence. As an example, when someone seeks to gratify the need of love, drinking, dancing, traveling, they often imitate the society of spectacle. They do it you know, according to a plan or a model already that is presented by culture industry. Being in congruence with advertisements, that's how simulacra society predominantly does it. Let's take traveling as an example to explain what I want to say. And I give example again from Morocco. In the past, Moroccan families used to travel being hosted by their relatives. Yes or not? When we used to travel, that is, we used to travel to see relatives more than we go to hotels or restaurants. It was, uh, I, I call it, it was a kin or blood tourism. Okay? Kin tourism or blood tourism in the past. They didn't travel for sightseeing alone, but also for seeing their kinfolk. Now, middle social class families and working classes even, each in accordance with their income, indulge in capitalistic tourism consuming the new cultural commodities of travel and entertainment using hotels, restaurants, parks, private beaches, snack shops and McDonald's. Where does the strength of capitalism come from? As Marcus maintained, capitalism doesn't only create the needs, but it satisfies them. This is where its strength comes from. Remember always I say, capitalism puts the chicken on the table. Despite its disadvantages, it still puts the chicken on the table. It doesn't only create the needs, but it satisfies them, which makes it successful and silences opposition and criticism. As you see from the arguments we have raised, capitalism has formed a culture industry that has been altering the needs of capitalistic societies. Those needs have changed man from a rational homo economicus to a dependent consumer on whose primary needs, false needs are superimposed. <coughs> These are needs he doesn't basically need. It's the culture industry that incurs the need. In other words, the manipulated consumer needs what society makes him need. Let us not forget that we said earlier about television and advertising as need amplifiers. They may turn their audience into market consumers, buying blindly what society rates as fashionable, desirable, and appropriate. These false needs are flimsy, liquid, and they are altered mechanically to meet the requirements of the liberal market. In final consideration, the economic capitalistic system creates a culture industry that benefits the accumulation of capital and the growth, and the growth of economy rather than profits the population who consume things that are not vital to their well-being. So what we consume, it's not necessarily all of it vital to our well-being or to our welfare. It profits 
the economic establishment more than it profits our social well-being. And best example, see how medicine often issues warnings against some market goods exposed for sale or some services put for sale. They tell us many warnings we see you know, on television or in newspapers telling us that th this product is lethal to your health, don't consume this, it's bad, and then they would draw it from the market. Junk food is a case in, is a case in point. But bear in mind, even the medical institution itself is at the mercy of monopoly of capitalism. Because they may ban something, they may, that is, they, 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 they say, that is, they issue warnings against some products, but they keep silent on others. And we ask questions about why are they keeping silent. Take the example, for instance, of the warnings against smoking or cigarettes or tobacco. Now, of course, in Europe, there is, um, uh, there is um, banning, banning tobacco is, is getting to a higher degree from public places and, and different sites. But what about alcohol? Why are they silent about alcohol? Or is alcohol not detrimental to, social, that is, uh, to human health? That's a question. And of course, we have a lot of sociological and, uh, that is, um, and, and, and medical treatises telling us that alcohol is detrimental, not only to health, but also to social, that is, to social ties, and, and, and destroys a lot of families. So where is then the intervention of human in this mechanically created choices? That's the question. How does or how do human beings intervene in, this, in these mechanically created choices? Because they, we have not created these choices, they are created by, that is, um, the mechanical reproduction. This question has already been investigated by Tocqueville, de Tocqueville, a hundred years ago again, as quoted in Abiago. What does de Tocqueville say? He argues that the private monopoly of culture targets the individual's mind. Rulers in the past, if you still remember I said that yesterday, rulers in the past <coughs> um, used, of course, um, to imprison, uh, that is, um, let's say, eccentric loners, or to kill them. Now they don't have to do that. Rulers do not need to imprison or kill those who do not think like them. They culturally alienate those who are radically different. How do they alienate them culturally? The eccentric outsider is emasculated economically. And these are my words. And this economic impotence may reduce the loner to an intellectual impotent. So, the war now against eccentric, that is, eccentric outsiders is not corporeal punishment, but it's economic punishment. You are economically punished. To be ostracized. The Tocqueville insists that the capitalistic mass production ensnares all segments of the population. We are now prisoners to this mass production system. Farmers, workers, salaried employees, petit bourgeois, all of us, we are ensnared, trapped in this in manufacturing consent to the ruling ideology. <coughs> we are unresistingly yielded into consumption. We don't have a choice. We should buy the pizza. Surprisingly, the ruled cultural dupes, I call them cultural dupes, it means, you know, uh, innocent consumers. The cultural dupes take consumption more seriously than the rulers themselves. Or the economic elite. Defrauded as they are, deceived or defrauded as they are, they still believe in the myth of success and accomplishment even more fervently than the successful. 
They are ambitious. They feed their souls on the ideology that enslaved them or that enslaves them. They innocently love the harm done to them by the economic power. They innocently love the harm done to them by the economic power, which even outgrows the canon of authorities. So even now I think that the authorities do not need even, that is to, to use any further canon, because there, there is, uh, the, these innocent consumers are trapped, you know, in the wheel of excessive or maximized consumption. The social bond of agreement in this respect is established through entertainment. And I think the social bond of agreement in this respect is established through entertainment. You have plenty of examples that we can discuss, you know, in recitation about people leaving, you know, serious issues and matters and they go to these trivialities of consumption that is unclinged to it. Like building houses or buying cars or, uh, or they want sw swimming pools in their villas or, or they want to travel and they leave, you know, that is the serious matters and issues that society, that, okay, that the population needs, you know, in order to um, uh, get, that is to uh, uh, concretize or that is uh, to reinforce, if you want, human, I say human development, not economic, not only economic development. Now we move to discuss the relationship between the concept of culture industry and the concept of spectacle, which is the last section. Guy Debord in the Society of Spectacle, another essay, has developed the concept of spectacle to refer to the obfuscation of the effects of capitalism. How they are obscured through the spread of mass consumption in an image-oriented society. So for him, the word spectacle, the term spectacle, masks or obscures that is, um, the effects of capitalism, especially, that is, the negative effects. Like, as we said, that is, um, political abuse, uh, social inequalities, for, it is a kind of false? Uh, false needs, yes. But here we are talking about, here we are talking about the effects of capitalism false needs that would be more a mechanism there. But it's here that is um, talking about social inequalities, talking about political abuse, talking about economic injustice, different effects that are, you know, obscured by the society of spectacle, by reinforcing, you know, this mechanism of spectacle or this medium of spectacle. According to the ball, the spectacle is a tranquilizing, pacifying, socially accepted avenue of entertainment that depoliticizes social life. I repeat again, for the bar, the spectacle is a pacifying, is a tranquilizing, socially accepted avenue of entertainment that depoliticizes social life in the sense that it, it in the sense that it cultivates dysfunction it pacifies the masses it narcotizes the masses it cultivates dysfunction it's a tool of massification it is a tool of massification destructing and seducing people it uses leisure and entertainment as mechanisms governed by advertising and commodity culture. The spectacle, according to the ball, is a symbol of unity of modern society, signaling a new stage in the development of capitalism, from the accumulation of material goods 
to the accumulation of images. The ball reviews here Mark's statement that people make their own history. He says, yes, people make their, their own history, but they don't make it free. They make it in environments and circumstances they do not control. Look at how the culture of the image dominates our perception of reality. Here we are back again to Baudrillard's notion of simulation of reality. It's a new social form of alienation. This image is a new social form of alienation when people have substituted the lived experience of micro everyday contact with simula or simulation. The spectacle expands the idea of reification. It objectifies social relations through images. Individuals experience the image as an objective reality that manipulates their lives and constitutes them as spectators. How can we exemplify this thingification of social relations? Between quotes, thingification of social relations. The image becomes the deed in the sense that the image becomes the object, the deed. In other words, people react to what television broadcasts as truth, to what circulates on the internet as truth. Moroccan Facebookers, for instance, moved from the tweets to the streets, reacting in outrage against the death of Mohsin Fikri being crushed under the compact of a garbage truck. But their protests were not stirred by the lived experience of the victim, but by his image sandwiched in a garbage track distributed on the internet. Image societies nowadays, we are image societies. Image societies nowadays condemn and praise individuals on the basis of their image experience, more than they judge them on the basis of their lived experience. And this is where the danger comes from. Image societies nowadays condemn and praise individuals on the basis of their image experience more than they judge them on the basis of their lived experience. Let me remind you here that spectacle for the ball is not a collection of images. The, 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 the concept spectacle doesn't mean a body of images or a collection of images. It's a body of social relations mediated by images. It means that our social relations are punctuated by images, regulated by images. It's the form of commodity that culture assumes, since it's no longer exchanged for use value and out of human need, but it is changed, but it is exchanged for money and out of pseudonyms or false needs. Spectacle destroys the notion of space and time. And I explain. Spectacle destroys our notion of space by transforming our organic spaces or our organic or the organic aspects of our spaces into enchantment like Disneyland like hotels dream parks spectacle destroys the notion of space by transforming the organic aspect into enchantment where spaces are rationally designed into fantasy land and other leisure spaces from hotels, restaurants, shopping malls, etc. Entertainment and simulation are transforming social space and time through the processes of rationalization and enchantment. <clears throat> it's not only space that is lost, uh, that is uh, affected, but time also. It seems to be lost from us. 
Like space-time is under the control of the spectacle commodity. It differs radically from the time in the pre-capitalist period. Very different. The time of cultural commodity from the time in the pre-capitalist period. Commoditized time. Now we are living in a commoditized time. Commoditized time has lost its use value and is quantified now in homologized, exchangeable manner. Our class is the best example. One hour and a half. Under the conditions of mass production, time is packaged into pseudo blocks and events and sold in an expanded economy of leisure activities. Take the example of how time is consumed and quantified in leisure packages, like video games or football matches, and different other leisure activities. What kind of criticism can we level at the boss concept of spectacle? The boss conceptualization of spectacle, I think, is very general and speculative. It's general and speculative because it lacks empirical evidence and specificity. Especially empirical specificity because we cannot generalize, you know, the effect of spectacle to all societies, you know, without taking into consideration cultural specificity, specificity from one cultural context or from one social context to another. Besides, the ball doesn't delve into the logics, okay, and contradictions of the concept of spectacle. He looks at, you know, he look, he, he, that is, uh, he essentializes a little bit the concept because he doesn't uh, um, put the concept into a dialogue, into a dialogic form that is stating the, uh, that is the counter arguments against spectacle or also what uh, how can we escape or how can we resist uh, that is uh, the effects of spectacle in general in general cultural industry conceals what we learn from this uh, that is uh, these explanations is that cultural industry conceals class contradictions and legitimizes social inequalities in a capitalistic system. So much so that they go virtually unnoticed. The strategy of concealment works through the spread of commodity and domination of money that transform goods into external independent objects. As a result, politics, religion, and culture all become commodities subject to the logic of accumulation, integrating all aspects of social life into a mass market. As we said yesterday, even God and his holy books become cultural commodities in a capitalistic system. Take the example of televangelists and mediated religion, religion on media, into consideration. According to Hockheimer and Adorno, the institutions of religion, education, music, and entertainment represent the founding pillars of mass deception, of mass deceptions and mystification inculcating people with social conformism and acceptance of the current and equal distribution of wealth. Cultural industries are engaged in ideological indoctrination, using entertainment and leisure to, to seduce people, masking the distinction between high and low culture. Thus, consumer choices and needs are standardized and homogenized in social enthusiasm for brand names and mass production, preventing the development of an autonomous creative, improvising, independent individual. So the predominant absent participant in this 
commodity culture is the autonomous, creative, improvising, independent individual. He's lost because we are standardized, homogenized into dependent consumers. So, it, so according to Hokkaiman and Adorno, resistance is almost lost. We cannot resist. We cannot resist inequalities, we cannot resist injustices, we cannot resist political abuse, or, or, or at least the abuse of power. We are at the mercy of this entertainment industry. Adorno here is very pessimistic. He laments the whole transformation of indigenous culture from an organic social production, from below to a manufactured, reified mass culture produced from above. The culture that is the, cult, the, the, the culture industry in the sense hollows out or impoverishes organic culture from its substantive content based on micro social connectedness and according to this trend we are and we will consume an instrumental cultural commodity of entertainment George Ritza names this global standardization of culture industry as globalization of nothing in which nothing refers to social forms centrally conceived, manipulated by corporate power, and comparatively devoid of distinctive content. Finally, the question to investigate further, and here I don't want to end my lecture with the pessimism of the Frankfurt School, but with the optimism of cultural studies, is whether there is still hope that the globalizing mass deception, not mass reception, or it's not mass reception. Sometimes they play on the words reception, deception, because they call it deception, because people are deceived and, and defrauded. So the question to investigate further with optimism is whether there is still hope that globalizing mass deception may fail its intent in its clash with indigenous, heterogeneous, interpretative frameworks and local anti-hegemonic frames of mind. Cannot we suggest that this encounter between local, organic cultures and global mass culture, here I'm speaking about developing societies and cultural spaces where the indigenous is still alive, can their encounter sow the seeds of our possible forms of resistance from below, nurturing diversity, variety, hybridity, and heterogeneity? Furthermore, affirmations of free choice, consumer demand, and difference, emphasizing advertising next to the niche market strategies targeting small segments of consumers, or belie the power of transnational corporations to homogenize cultural production and really manipulate mass consumption. Hence, the possibility of consumer resistance. Thank you. Now, just before that is, uh, we close this lecture, I want to give the references to be consulted. First, we have Max Hochheimer's and Theodore Adorno's The Culture Industry, Enlightenment as Mass Deception. That's a chapter in the dialectic of enlightenment. That's already you have. Then we have Theodore Adorno, Culture Industry Reconsidered. Culture Industry Reconsidered. That's also a chapter in a book from the Culture Industry, Selected Essays on Mass Culture. From his, uh, that is a book, and it's an edited book, The Culture Industry, Selected Essays in Mass Culture. Then we have an article by Erviago, and this is where you find the discussion of false needs, that, that is most of the information we got from this article. 
Does capitalism, does capitalism and culture industry create false needs? A study of Marcus Adorno and Hockheim. I repeat, here we go. Does capitalism and the cultural industry create false needs? A study of Marcus Adorno and Hockheim. The last reference is the book by Guy Debord, The Society of the Spectacle. Thank you very much.